Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. By request, I have a video on how I created this artwork. This is um, an artwork done in pastel pencil on pastel mat, and it is the piece of artwork that kind of uh, broke me out of a creative rut I had been experiencing. So um, I did turn on the cameras and record as I was creating it, but I didn't really, I, I didn't put myself under the pressure that it had to turn into anything, but I thought, well, in case it does, then at least I have some footage that I can perhaps use. I'm working on pastel matte paper, which is, it's not a sanded paper, but it has a coating on it that feels um, almost like a, a really fine emery board. It is a cellulose coating. It's not a, a sand, but it does have a little bit of that gritty feeling. And I'm using pastel pencils and I'm using a combination. I'm starting off with uh, Derwent pastel pencils. And then I have a few other brands that I bring in towards the end since um, this set here only has 24 colors. Um, I am sketching in with with kind of the um, native color of each of the little gummy bears. And I'm using a reference photo from Unsplash, which is one of the uh, websites I use to pull reference photos from. I like it because it's really easy to organize your photos into different categories. So like, even if I'm not feeling very inspired or maybe it's like, it's late at night and I'm not gonna go down into my studio, I, I don't really feel like creating, but I kind of want to pull some ideas together. I can go on my laptop or, um, or even my phone and I can kind of like just browse photos and kind of put them into categories. Like if I see a landscape that might be cool or I see, you know, some different things I might want to pull images from different photos together, I can do that. So um, I highly recommend it. It's got a wonderful categorizing feature there. You can put things in different categories, different folders, um, collections, they call it. So um, yeah, definitely check that out. You do have to log in, make a free account, log in to do that. But it's, um, it's really neat. As I was working on this, these gummy bears kind of reminded me of, have you ever seen those, um, those claw machines in an arcade where you like, you know, you put your tokens in and you try to grab, but I never, ever have gotten anything out of those machines. But, um, you know, you try and you can grab a, a prize and then like, um, that's kind of what this reminded me of. I think because the pastel pencils and the pastel mat kind of have that bit of a fuzzy texture to it. So it was a really fun challenge to try to get that translucent effect with the pastel pencils. Uh, getting a translucent effect with an opaque medium. Pastel pencils are very opaque. Uh, and I often don't use, I, I'm trying to think the last time I used just pastel pencils on a piece and I honestly, I don't know if I have. I tend to use these over watercolors or um, to get me some sharp edges with a pastel painting, but uh, but on their own, as their own thing. Um, I really don't use them like that, but when I was playing with some pastel mat the other day and I was kind of just sketching with the pastel pencils, I was like, you know, I think that would be a really fun combination. And when you're in a point where you're feeling like, art block or creativity block or just having a creative dry spell. Anytime you feel those sparks, you get that little spark of inspiration, just try to nurture that spark and go with it. It's kind of like when you're trying to like light a campfire and you know, all the brush is all damp and you know, it's been raining. You're just trying to get that campfire fire started. So you've got the, you got the match and you're just trying not to let the, the wind blow it out. You're just trying to have it light something. That's what those little artistic sparks are like and you want it to take hold. You want it to catch fire. So, um, so, you know, guard, that spark carefully and and um, nurture it and then you might come up with something that you really like now one thing i've i really uh did a lot here was to use the white pastel pencil and put in my highlights first and the reason i did that was because um i wasn't sure how many layers the pastel mark would take of pastel pencil it takes lots and lots of layers of colored pencil but i didn't know with a pastel pencil if it would clog the tooth a little too quickly because although it's a sanded paper or no, it's not a sanded paper it's a it's a pastel prepared paper. It, uh, you know, it, it does feel not really smooth, but it doesn't have like a really aggressive tooth. So um, I was a little concerned about filling the tooth in too quickly and then not being able to go in and put my highlights in afterwards. So um, I, I could go in with a really soft stick pastel to put in highlights in the if I wanted to but um I just really want to keep it to the pastel pencils and I can use a kneaded eraser and press it, it in and lift up some pastel if it does get clogged so that's another way you can you could get around it I find that you don't need to use fixative on either sanded papers or this pastel mat which is really nice so you can just kind of leave it the way it is and you're not going to have a ton of um of dust kind of coming off it does lock the um 
the media really well, kind of like velour paper, if you've ever used that, which it sounds weird. How does velour paper work? But velour paper, I also find does not need fixative. Um, the thing I also found with that pastel matte, if you make a mistake or if you like get water or anything like that on the paper, it does kind of stain it. So um, I would be kind of nervous to use a fixative on this paper, actually. I think it would really, uh, it would definitely stain any untreated I, well, I don't say definitely, but I think it would probably darken any untreated paper as well as darkening your media. Now, a pastel mat comes with, it comes in a pad, and it, or you can get sheets of it, but in pads anyway, I don't know about sheets, but in the pads, it comes with um, a piece of glassine interleaved between the pages. So when I pull a sheet of pastel mat out, I, I make sure to keep the glassine attached to it so that um, when I'm done with my artwork, I can just fold the glassine back over and I can store it. Um, I store my pastel paintings in a large portfolio envelope and I picked it up I picked up a bunch of them at AC Moore. They're very, they're very affordable. They can either be cloth, like a canvas material. Sometimes they're like a, like a laminated uh, type of paper. But they're just basically a really big envelope, and um, you can put a bunch of, of uh, paintings in there. So I have a few different sizes of those. I keep, uh, I, I will generally mix medias, except for my pastels. I do keep all my pastels in its own envelope because. Um, just because of the chance of some dust falling out. But I do wrap all my pieces, either oil pastel or um, like a soft pastel. I wrap them in glassine and tape it to the back and then slide it in the envelope. And that keeps uh, that keeps it from rubbing. It keeps the dust from uh, smearing. I haven't had any issues. And I use very little fixative, if any, on my work. I don't like it. A lot of people ask me about it, but I just don't, um, I don't really care for it. This piece took me three hours, guys, three hours. And it is like, it's only like seven and a half by nine inches. It's not a big piece. Uh, so that's why it's time-lapsed and I have it time-lapsed quite a bit. So just to, just to give you a little bit of an idea. So this gummy bear I'm working on now is a like a white, a white kind of translucent gummy bear. And so I started off with the bright highlights. Then I put in a glaze of just kind of like um, not super saturated white. And now I'm going in and adding the colors that you're going to see either reflected or you're going to see through the bear uh, to give it that translucent look. So it's just kind of a subtle layering. Now see that pencil in my hand right now? That's how the Derwent pencils used, pastel pencils used to look. Um, so that's one of my old ones. And I have a old spice rack that I uh, was meant to be either like mounted on the wall or up on its end, but I flipped it over so it's flat and I use that for my pencils. And sadly, I can't find the uh, spice rack that I use to store my pencils, but I did find similar bamboo ones on Amazon. Um, I'll try to remember to link it. I'll probably forget, but that's where I, that's where you can find similar ones. If you look, um, and it doesn't really matter because you can't really see my pastel rack here, but um, in, in previous art studio tours, I show the, uh, I show, it used to be where I keep all my Prismacolor color pencils, but I have since, um, so I, I since built a larger color pencil storage solution for a bunch of different brands, and then I had this left over, so I use it for my pastel pencils and my water brush pens and my, um, oh, just some kind of random things that I reach for a lot, so it's just, uh, just handy. And honestly, you know, use whatever works. I, I once took, um, and this is not my idea and I've seen a lot of people do it, but I took a shoe box and I saved like paper towel rolls and toilet paper rolls and cut them down and put them in the shoe box. And that was a great way to, uh, to sort pencils by color, by color family. So that's another way you can make your own, um, your own storage. A lot of people like binders. I don't care for the storing my supplies in like the binders, like the booklets for pencils. Um, for me, that's too finicky. And I like to be able to just grab my stuff easily. So I either keep them in their trays or I have them in cups or jars or some sort of stand where I can see all the colors together and get to them quickly. Uh, it's nice if you have a good variety of pencils. I don't think you need to have a ton. You don't need to have like 72, but um, but it is nice to have a variety. And the one thing I'll say though, is that I will use like my Derwent tinted charcoal, my Derwent pastel pencils, my general pastel pencils, my create a color charcoal pencils. My I'm gonna use all of those together. They're all a very similar medium. And I know that some people call pastel and charcoal. It's like a lot of those pencils are almost indistinguishable because like a colored charcoal, can it behaves and works so well with a quote unquote pastel pencil. So, and I'm talking about the chalk pastel, not um, like pastel tinted pencils. Like I'm not talking about that, you know, really popular. There's been all those really popular 
uh, pastel shaded colored pencils that have been hitting the market the last couple of years. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the chalk. These are all chalky pastel pencils. Um, it can be confusing. It can be confusing with the, and it's kind of like pastel isn't technically chalk. Although I think the pastel pencils probably contain more chalk than like a pastel stick. But when I say chalk, uh, chalk and soft, meaning chalky, um, like has like a clay and a chalk and things like that in it to make it feel dry versus an oil pastel which can also be soft or hard. And yeah, between all of the uh, the soft pastels, or so, soft pastels mean they're kind of like chalky, but there's like hard soft pastels and there's extra soft soft pastels and everywhere in between. So it's uh, it can be confusing. So just try to keep your mediums um, like with like and you're not gonna, you're not gonna go wrong. Um, like oil pastels and chalk pastels wouldn't be the best to use together because if you put oil pastels over chalk pastels, it would just kind of make a gummy paste. And if you were to put... Um, chalk pastels over oil pastels it just wouldn't stick like you would just pick up the oil with your chalk pastels or your soft pastels so um yeah it, it can be confusing but once you try to start using the materials then you won't be confused anymore because you'll know what will work uh and i have um i have so many different brands i have uh, one of my favorite brands which i don't think they sell in the united states anymore is van gogh the van gogh chalk pastel pencils were were so nice i had a set of 60 of those and i've had them for probably 20 years or more, and uh, they're really wonderful. The colors are great. They're nice and soft, but I think I, I don't think you can get them outside of Europe anymore. They came into a local art store, and uh, I got the colored pencils and the pastel pencils. I didn't get the watercolor pencils, but they all are still really highly rated, but you just can't get them over here anymore. I think they're by uh, Talons, I believe, is the, um, is the company that makes them. But I guess there's a lot of good brands. I haven't used all of them. I've only used the Generals, the Van Gogh, and the Derwent and the Creative Color, um, and just a few colors of those. But honestly, I don't see a huge difference in the in the quality. Um, the Generals would probably be the most affordable if you are looking to just get a set. I think they, I think 36 is the biggest set they do. And um, you know, definitely shop around. Blick probably has the best price, but you never know. Try try Amazon. Try. Uh, try wherever. Derwent's good, especially if you're getting like the bigger sets. They have a they have a good price. I find theirs to be kind of on the hard side, but the leads are nice and thick, so you do tend to get a, a good amount for your money. I've heard really good things about um, Karen Dosh's. I haven't used them myself, but I've heard good things about those. I'm uh, mostly saying they're really soft, so they would be good, I guess, to put those final layers on. Maybe do like the bulk of it in a harder one, like a like a Derwent, and then like finish up with the Karen Dosh. And I've also heard the Carbothellos are good, but I haven't used those either. Uh, so if you have a recommendation and you'd like to post it in the comments down below, that would be wonderful because it will help other folks in the community try to decide what they want to get. I, But like I said, I don't notice like a huge difference between the different brands and it could just be I don't use them enough to have developed that subtlety uh, or noticing the subtleties in between them. So uh, so please do recommend, even if it's a store brand, you know, recommend what what's worked well for you in the uh, in the comments below, but um, I find they all work great together. And I'm sure just like in any other medium, you're gonna see that like Derwent has this color and Generals has that color and you know, they're all a little bit different. So, you know, oh, I want the, I want a really dark green. So I'm gonna go with Derwent. I want a really black black. So I'm gonna go with Generals or, you know, so on and so forth until you have developed that palette that works really well for you. Uh, I love to layer and mix colors rather than just try to find the perfect color because then you end up with um, a more diverse, color a more natural look and um i think i think in most cases when you're using a limited palette your work looks stronger because you have to uh, everything harmonizes because you're mixing so much but also you're getting um you're getting you know you, you have to mix it you have to really look and get those values right and values are really what makes the artwork stand out now i put a piece of paper down under my hand because um i had to rest my hand on the paper on the uh, artwork and i didn't want to smear it or get it all over myself so if you take just any piece of paper uh, glassing is great but if you don't have it just a piece of notebook paper like i have just lay it down and um, that's going to keep you from rubbing against the paper. That's why when you wrap your pastel paintings in glassine and you store them, even without fixative, they don't get all smeared because there's nothing rubbing against the painting. You've got a still piece of paper against your pastel painting. It's not like that paper is loose and is going to rub and smear. That's why sometimes in sketchbooks, your, if you do a pastel piece, um, it can smear on the other paper because, you know, you're turning the pages of the book. There is a little bit of friction there. If you were to tape a piece of glassine down over that page um, and tape it so it's not going to move when you turn the pages, then it wouldn't smear. But then you couldn't look through it, look through your sketchbook very easily. So... 
In the case of a sketchbook, I will, I am more inclined to use fixative. I typically don't use pastels in sketchbooks unless it's just a little bit of a, like a finessing, like a little, little, uh, zhuzhing up of a watercolor or something, or I'm just doing like, um, you know, all earth tone, like I'm doing a life drawing class or something. And I'm just working with Conte crayon, which is like a chalky, um, a chalky crayon. And uh, I'm just doing like brown sepia and white or something like that. So uh, yeah, you'll find your groove, you know, experiment. Don't, don't be, don't feel like you have to know it all. You don't need to know anything. When you grab your supplies, you just need to create. I think a lot of times we get in our head about everything and it's like, well, I, I can't create art until I know how to create art. Well, how are you going to know how to create art how are you going to know how to use pastels? How are you going to know how to do any of this until you do it? <clears throat> My dad always said, and he was a contractor, um, if you want to learn how to build a house, build a house. You know, that's how you're going to learn. And uh, my husband's always doing these projects around the house and he gets it done and he's like, oh, now if I had to do it again, it would be perfect. You know, because like you learn so much by doing it. You can watch all the videos. You can read all the how-to books. Um, but until you put it to practice, you actually do the thing, you don't really know what you're talking about. You really don't know how to do it until you until you do the thing. It's like when people are giving me advice, um, <clears throat> I don't take advice very well. I'm going to, I'm going to come right out and say it. I, I don't ask for advice very often because quite frankly, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I don't, I don't deal with criticism very well. Um, <clears throat> no, but really it's like when people, when people give you advice that haven't actually done the thing they're trying to advise you on, that drives me nuts. It's like, how are you going to tell me how I should do, like people without children giving you parenting advice. It's like, you know what? You can read all the books you want. You can watch all of the videos you want. You can listen to all the psychologists and all the psychiatrists, but until you have children of your own, you really don't know what you're talking about. So it's the same thing with art. If somebody's trying to give you advice on your painting and they've never picked up a brush, well, take that with a big old shaker full of salt, okay? Anybody that's that's done it, anybody that's gone through it, um, first of all, isn't going to judge you. And secondly, they will give you, they probably won't give you advice unless you ask for it. And then their advice will be worth listening to because they've actually done the thing they're trying to tell you about. Um, <clears throat> when I went to college, all of our professors were working in the industry. I went to broadcasting school. Communi I have a communications degree. So every one of our instructors actually were working in the communications field. I, our, our announcing and production class was taught by a, um, a radio announcer who produced commercials. Our TV classes were taught by television professionals that were working in the industry. It's funny now, though, because when you go to um, to these different colleges, and I think even the college I went to, the the only people teaching the classes now have PhDs, but haven't necessarily worked in the industry, which I think is such a shame. Because um, how is somebody who's never done it professionally supposed to tell you how to do it? So it does. It just it just really it really bothers me when you have a bunch of know it alls telling you what to do that haven't actually done the thing. This isn't so much of a tutorial as it is an essay on life. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I hope you're enjoying it nonetheless. At least you can kind of see how this comes together. I had so much, I can't remember the time, a time where I had so much fun creating an artwork than this one right here. I was listening to an audiobook. Uh, I was listening to, um, which one was it? Now I've forgotten. Uh, it was a David Sedaris uh, Calypso. I was listening to Calypso by David Sedaris. And um, I was just really enjoying it. I was just, you know, really uh, in the zone and having a lot of fun. And and I, I encourage you to play without expectation in your either your sketchbook or with your your products. Don't worry about ruining something. Don't worry about it being perfect. Just play. I think that most artists have art block from time to time. Mine tends to come in the winter and it's frustrating and you can feel like you're never going to get through it and you'll never have another good idea and you've just like, you've used it all up, you've scraped the bottom of the creativity barrel and that there is no more. But the one good thing about coming through an art block and doing it repeatedly is that you know you will get through it. And, uh, so it does build you a little bit of resilience and it, and you just know, it's like, okay, I've been here before. It's awful. It's going to last a while, but then I will get through it and how you deal with it is going to be individualized for me. It's uh, it's to push through. It's to keep on creating and keep on creating and keep on creating until that spark comes back until something 
excites me. And then you nurture that little spark. Like I mentioned before, we're building the campfire. You nurture that little spark and then something happens. And um, it's uh, it's great when it does. It's so great when it does. And sometimes, you know, you'll go back and you'll look at the things that you created during an art block, the things that you hated, that you weren't happy with, that you just wanted to throw in the trash. And you'll, you'll look at it sometime when you're kind of in a kind of a creative um, kind of renaissance and you'll look back at that and you'll be like, you know, that wasn't so bad. A lot of it is just our mindset. When we're feeling art blocked, our artwork can be lovely that we're making, but it's just that kind of like um, your perception, that perception of the art at the time, the way you're feeling, the way your mood is, it could be completely tarnishing the work that you're doing. Um, somebody else could look at it and say, it looks great. What are you talking about? It's almost like you get this dysmorphia about how your art looks. And um, you may be really easy to abandon a project. That's how I, that's how I get it. Unless it's like, I was thinking the only artwork I've liked that I had done during January and February were my critique club lessons. And mainly that was because, oh, I've got to have this done. These people depend on me. So I can't abandon it. And because um, I abandoned a lot of artwork that I just wasn't happy with how it was going. So there were certain ones that's like, oh, I got a deadline. I need to get this done. So I'm not going to abandon it. Um, so that's why I say the pushing through helps. It helps me anyway. I know that's not for everyone. Other people may want a more gentle approach. And if you do, then absolutely do what's right for you. But for me, it is pushing through. I don't know who said it. It was, I think it was either Albert Einstein or Pablo Picasso. I'm not sure, but it's something to the effect of, um, inspiration comes, but it has to find you working or, or the muse comes, but she needs to find you working something like that. Meaning that, um, you need to put in the time, you know, nothing miraculous is just going to happen out of the ether and you're going to create something great. You need to be putting in the time. And then once in a while you get that little spark. And I think that kind of like spark of, um, of motivation, of inspiration is the, um, exception and not the rule. So if you're just waiting around to be in the mood to create, then you're never going to create because, and when you are in the mood to create, when you start creating, you may find that you can't put onto paper what you want, what's in your brain, because you haven't practiced, you haven't put in the practice. Do you think that, you know, somebody walks out on the gymnastics mat on the Olympics and puts out a beautiful performance because they're inspired to? No, it is like it is decades of or years of hard work and dedication that's bringing them to that point where they are creating art before your eyes. So don't think it's as easy as it looks. The same thing with um, dance, the same thing with painting, the same thing with sculpting. It's and the same thing with writing. It is practice, 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 you make a bunch of garbage, and then eventually you get good at it. So uh, you may have some beginner's luck when you start out, but chances are you're just really into the process and enjoying the process and really just loving what you're making. If you look back at that after 30 years of really working hard at your craft and you look back at those first things, you might be like, oh, okay, that's not that great. But before you knew what you didn't know, before you didn't know what you needed to know, how do I want to say that? You know, back then, <laughs> you thought it was great because it was, you know, you were enjoying the process and it was new. And every day you sat down to create, you grew by leaps and bounds and you, and you grew so much and you learned so much and you kept getting progressively better at large leaps. And then the more you do it, the more you plateau and the harder you have to work to make a little incremental improvement. So it can be difficult to stay inspired when you kind of get to that stage where you're not growing as fast as you were in the beginning. But, um, you know, that's, and that's where the hard work comes in. You know, that's where you can't just wait to be inspired. You actually have to push and work and, uh, and get through it and just trust that the spark will come back and it will, it will. It's, but you know, it's, um, it is kind of like a job. You, if you want to get the results you want to get, you have to put in that daily work and, um, yeah, waiting for the, waiting for the muse is, is total BS in my opinion. Uh, other people might disagree with me, but, um, I think that's just kind of buying into that whole um, romantic view of art. That's just not how it is. It's uh, it's just made to look easy, but you know, you got to show up, you got to work, and you got to struggle a bit. You got to push through when things aren't working, and um, and then when it does work, and then when you feel that spark again, it's so worth it. 
I'm just trying to fill in the rest of the space here. Uh, there is, uh, I, I did kind of like, I had a couple reference photos and honestly, I was kind of skipping around and trying to kind of wedge gummy bears in where I thought they would look nice. So I didn't have too many of the same color next to each other. And um, they were kind of slightly turned differently and whatnot. They kind of look a little bit all different. Some of them look like they might have melted a little bit, but I think that's all right. I think that's part of the part of the charm of this piece, which is just kind of fun. And uh, and I just really like it. I like it. This would be one I would frame and hang up in my kitchen with, you know, I rarely frame anything, but I do love colorful food and candy illustrations. I don't know why exactly. I don't even have a sweet tooth typically. I just, uh, just like the way they look. I love the way especially translucent candies like uh, lollipops and gummy bears and things like that look where you can see different lights through them. I also love the way the glass looks. I have a whole class on uh, painting colored glass if you uh, are interested in that. I'll try to remember to link it down below. If not, you can just click on the link to my teachable school and it's there. But, um, but yeah, I just love getting that little bit of um, uh, shine and translucency in the work. I'm going in with some black. This is one of the Van Gogh pencils. I'm going in with a black and just kind of uh, really intensifying the cracks in between to get that really dark pop because the paper itself is kind of like a charcoal. It's not a real black. And I'm also going in with bright white and pulling up the brightest highlights. And there you have it. I love how this came out. I hope you enjoyed our little creative pep talk today and I hope it inspires you to um, drudge through the drudgery and uh, just push through the times when your artwork is frustrating you. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.